be to God. In the time of King Herod, with these words, Epiphany unfolds. Thank you, Joe, Giuseppe, for so well unfurling today's fabled story. Thank you, Hannah, for your accompaniment and echoes. In the time of King Herod, the so-called great, in the time of King Herod's hate, in the time of the fearful puppet king of the Jews, Herod, appointed and controlled by Rome, in the time of King Herod, the one who out of fear over losing power killed his second wife and three sons he saw as rivals, in the time of this king where politics had life and death implications, in the time of uncertainty, instability, stress, death, occupation, attempted insurrections, in the time of King Herod, in the time when Jesus was born. The contrast here is stark and intentional by our gospel writer. For in that time of great contrasting displays of what constituted power, wise magi come from the East. An unspecified number of these magi or Zoroastrian priests traversed afar from ancient Persia, modern Iran, Iraq, their gaze raised to the night skies following yonder star. Or was it a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that is only visible every, every several centuries? These astrologer magi priests leave their places of instability, their, no, their places of stability toward the place of instability and wander into the wild, wild west out of wonder about a star of wonder with royal beauty bright. Something shines out into their world and they were paying attention. A portent of possibility, a beacon of birth. Strong enough to get their attention, its glimmer summons a new radically hopeful reality and they follow. Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? Strikes me as odd, however, that they ask this question to the very person who sees himself as the current king of the Jews, infamous Herod. Were they blissfully unaware or intentionally confrontational? Either way, Herod is not too happy to encounter foreigners inquiring after a toddler rival to his throne. And so out of fear, the text makes clear, Herod begins to lie. Go, keep on your cosmic quest, but tell me where you find him, and I might go and pay homage after you, lies the murderous king. Lies that incite, for we remember that these lies lead to the massacre of the innocent boys under the age of two we read about and discussed together and reflected on last Sunday. But one thing that should stand out to us in this story is that Herod is not the only one who is afraid here. Verse 3 says that the whole of Jerusalem with him was frightened by the Magi's inquiry. The mere thought of a change, a shift in status quo, a challenge to those who've always been in power brought shivers down the spines. And in response, the spineless one begins to lie. But perhaps even worse, people allow these lies to resound unchecked. No checks, no balances, the unethical abuse of power not only unimpeded, but perpetuated. Perhaps here lies the greater sin. This past Wednesday, January 6, on the actual feast day of the Epiphany, we witnessed a shocking embodiment of lies that incite. As domestic terrorists using US flags as weapons, some carrying Jesus 2020 flags, some carrying guns, and many donning Make America Great Again hats on their heads and utter, uttering shouts of anger from their hearts, illegally broke into, vandalized, terrorized the US Capitol. Now, this shocking mob riot was a perpetuation of the coup attempt that began long before the contested election this past November. These angry extremists who are in the minority displaced and temporarily stopped the process of honoring the voices of the majority who voted their conscience to birth something new. Yes, the loudest bully in the furthest thing from a pulpit 
has been the current occupant in the White House who has been spewing lies since his sparsely attended inauguration. No question the way his lies incited Wednesday's violence was deplorable, unacceptable, and yes, he should be held accountable, whatever ways in which the government chooses to hold him accountable, it must be done. And those who violated that space, justice beckons. We do that with our children. We should do that with even elected officials. No one is above being above the law. I'm grateful to be part of a church community that since 2016 has been unapologetically critical of those who lie in government, those who sit Herod in president's clothing. In fact, you may have caught on that I have refused to use the name of the one who I claim sits as an occupant in the White House these past four years. It might be my own subtle form of protest. Yet I found it helpful for my own well being to keep this worship space in a different light. Yet all the while, we've done our part to call out lies from Muslim bans to separating refugee children to the myriad anti-climate, pro-fossil fuel, anti-people, anti-women, anti-BIPOC, pro-billionaire racist policies. It's important for us to name that. However, just as in this epiphany story, Herod is not the biggest problem. The Herods of our world, like the pharaohs of Moses's time, come and go. But they would not rise to ascendancy and remain in power if not for the support tacit or explicit of the masses. Did you notice that hours after this cowardly attack on the Capitol, 139 representatives and eight senators still voted against certifying the clear results of the election in favor of further perpetuating lies, lies that had just contributed to the tragic death of five people. The lies and violence of Herods and Pharaohs are bad, but the masses who fall in line and actively support them are even worse. And perhaps worse still, the silence of those who disagree with such lies, but remain inactive on the sidelines, TV clickers in hands, draw, jaws dropped, yet feeling far disconnected from the chaos and not disturbed enough to disturb the status quo from which they often benefit. The images of violence that we have seen from the Capitol, from angry white men breaking into law offices, to reporters video equipment being trampled, to elected officials ducking for cover, to t-shirts, and this is hard to hear, with Camp Auschwitz written on them, have shaken us to the core. They have angered us. They have demoralized us. The incendiary, reckless, and seditious rhetoric of leaders in stoking such violence has infuriated us, and we're appalled by the larger realities of turmoil and bitter division across this country, which this week's events do not allow us to deny. My friends, make no mistake, what we have witnessed this week is the sin of American white supremacy on wild display. Wednesday was not a dark day, as so many have said, unthinking, but a very white day. From the Confederate flag carried boldly through the Capitol, the scaffolding and noose constructed on the plaza outside to the indisputable contrast between the way invaders, invading rioters were treated Wednesday and the way non-seditious peaceful BLM protesters have been treated at other points throughout this past year. There is simply no denying the stain of racism laid bare. And most of us are complicit in this expansive sin, and therefore the work of anti-racism cries out. We are aware of that cry here at Church of the Covenant, and I'm so grateful for our ongoing commitment to racial justice in this congregation, a core part of our current five-year missional plan. I've heard the word reconciliation been tossed around a lot this week, as a house divided against itself surely shall not stand. And while I agree we have, and perhaps for centuries have been a house divided, I wanna push back a bit on the quick call to reconciliation, especially within church circles. For before we can ever get to an approximation of such a word, we must full take on the word reckoning, of truth telling, of looking at hard realities and doing some hard work. Desmond Tutu knows this well, first, the truth telling, then maybe, possibly, hopefully, reconciliation. 
We've also heard many voices since Wednesday and maybe uttered them ourselves. We're not like this. This is not who we are. History, of course, tells us otherwise. Author Brian Stevenson reminds us the U.S. is a nation founded on genocide and chattel slavery. And so as Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts, Alan Gates, who reminded us that reckoning requires us to look ourselves in the mirror and say, this is a part of who we are. But let us repent and change that part. Perhaps a part of each of us were storming the Capitol this week, as hard as that is to imagine, through our upholding of the systems that require us to state the obvious God truths that Black Lives Matter. I was unnerved this week to hear voices from all different sides of the political spectrum naming the Capitol building as sacred, a temple to democracy, as sacrosanct. While I understand well the importance of symbol and the power of historic sanctuaries and respecting such spaces, I feel naming the US Capitol with such elevated language reveals a dangerous historical amnesia. For the work of reckoning reminds us that this building originally finished in 1800 was built in large part by slaves. A Capitol building for a country that hypocritically lofted itself as a shining beacon of democratic equality and light to the world. Its so-called hallowed halls resounded with all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, while only referring, of course, to white men of a certain class. Thomas Jefferson insisted this house first be called Capitol rather than Congress House as part of a strong nationalistic mythology linking the American and Roman republics. For the word capital comes from the Latin associated with the temple of Jupiter located on Capitoline Hill. Jupiter, the king of the Roman gods, farther sky, the divine upgrade of Greek Zeus. Affixed to the top of that capital dome is an image with a complex history, the Statue of Freedom, whose colossal bronze depiction of a goddess of liberty was assembled by Philip Reed in 1863, who is still a slave. The statue is topped not with a traditional knit cap provided to freed slaves in ancient Rome, because Jefferson Davis, who was before becoming the president of the Confederacy, in charge of the overall construction of that capital, objected to its use. There is more light that needs to be shed on this building that holds such patriotic sentiment Yet, ups, yet upholds such white supremacy. In adding to the many, this is not who we are this week, I've also heard people say how unprecedented this mob riot, and that since 1814, we've never seen something like this before. Indeed, it was unique. Yet such statements reveal the vantage point from which we are gazing into the American experiment. And they imply that only history that matters is white American history. For BIPOC Americans, mob riots and coups have been all too common, from Tulsa's Black Wall Street Massacre to Wounded Knee to the coup in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 to Philandro Castile, George, George Floyd. My friend and colleague, Reverend Kate Haynes Murphy writes, while white Americans like me see what happened Wednesday as a strange, unfathomable aberration, BIPOC Americans see it as another verse in the same song of death this country has been singing since the beginning. We white Americans need to understand why this is happening and say clearly, not in my name, not with my active or passive support. I want the kind of country where all Americans enjoy equal protection under the law. I want to live in a country where all life is sacred. Not saying anything is saying something. Kate went on to also write that I am glad police officers showed such restraint on Wednesday, but I grieve the truth it reveals that police officers are able to de-escalate terrifying situa situations when they choose to do so. Friends, this week has been hard, it has been sad, but it has not been a week for us to remain silent. In the time of King Herod, in the time of riots and double standards, in the time of lies that incite. A child is born in the time of powerful love. In condemning the attack on the Capitol and calling on the sitting president to do likewise, President-elect Biden said Wednesday, 
some words that are powerful. Simply, words are powerful. And at their worst, words can incite. At their best, words can inspire. In the time of King Herod, in the time of powerful love, a child is born, a light sparkled. When the Magi saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. I wonder what words they used as they took a knee. Words from their mouths, words of silence from their heart. Words I'm sure that inspired. Words for Mary and Jesus living in poverty, suddenly visited by majestic foreigners who had traversed afar to adore on bended knee. Words can inspire. Friends, I wonder what words each of us will use in the coming days. We don't know how things will unfurl from here, but we do know the words we can lift up from our mouths and from our hearts. Words beyond unreal and impeach. Words that inspire across divides. Truth that inspires. I love that Reverend Dr. Warnock is headed to the Senate in Georgia. That is inspiration that sends. I love that we are all able right now to come across into this Zoom space in the different places with the different gifts that we are given in the midst of a raging pandemic to find inspiration, solidarity, to shine into the amazing grace of God together. Friends, the truth is, even with Twitter finally silencing presidential lies, I don't hold much hope out for America. It's not where I place my ultimate trust. In my better moments, when I act out of my better self, I place my trust in God, the God of Epiphany, the God of Emmanuel, and in the hope of a beloved community that is emerging even now. I love that the dreamers we call magi after paying their homage, leaving their gifts and words of inspiration are filled with joy because they dreamed again. And in this dream, they dreamed of a world liberated from Herod's lies. They dreamed of a hope that would shine forth and a hope that would lead them home by another road. They charted a new path courageously, leaving out King Herod and allowing for the protection to rise up for the humble king. And in this act of civil disobedience, which was inc incredibly risky, they charted a new path for each of us. We remember that Herod, who killed his own family members, certainly wouldn't hesitate to seek out those who weren't loyal to his dishonest agenda. But these magi boldly disobeyed and spoke truth in love by going home another road. Friends, we don't know the road the United States will take from this point forward. I don't know if this past Wednesday was the death knells of a particularly vile chapter in our history or a warning sign of chaos still to come. But I do know the promise of epiphany, that we are all magi, we all have tremendous gifts to share, far more valuable than gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We all have an essential role to play. This is not the time to sit on the sidelines. God is ready to use each of our gifts in all the places where we find ourselves this day. There is great power. There is great hope in that epiphany promise. For the way we respond to the pandemics of COVID and racism we now face as a collective people is another road for us to be led home. A sacred road that leads us to deeper truths, an alternative road that leads us to dream of a new nation that is not afraid to reckon with its history, but is not linked and bound to its past sins. A nation that can chart a new course that speaks of truths of mutual inspiration and shared uplift, a road that leads to justice's jubilee and liberation for all, for real. Friends, shall we walk this road together? I love that the number of magi in Matthew's story is unspecified. For what if instead of imagining three that gently and 
nicely fit into our nativity sets, we dreamed of more, of hundreds of magi, thousands of magi, millions of magi bringing their gifts, speaking their truths, and so inspiring others. And all of us then going back home, another road, a whole new order being dreamed up. That is worth the risk of following a star. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Holy One has risen upon you. Friends, in that light, let us rise up and shine on. Amen.